time we'll dismiss the children's church. Take your Bibles this morning. Let's go to John chapter 5, please. John chapter 5 and verse 39. I haven't done this in a while. And in one of my devotional books that I was reading had an acrostic of some of this and I've changed a few others uh, because this was accompanying more of a different aspect but you know great thing about acrostics is for those of you who don't know what acrostics I'm going to take the word scriptures and put a word to each letter and as you do this, this was talking about our Christian walk, and I want to show you the importance of searching the scriptures and finding the answers you need. Because God's word is full of answers. It's like anything else, if you want to know the answers, you got to look at the book. My brother just took a contracting license test for his company, since he services restaurants across the United States. He had five books, and he showed me a picture of the books. They're massive. They're absolutely massive, but it covers licenses in 17 states. And each book has got to be thousands of pages. And he's got to read every book. And then they give him an open book test and give him six hours to take this test, but he has to know where in that book to find the answer. And he's got five books. And they were literally sitting on his desk. He goes, I'm too old for this. And I'm thinking, okay, you give me six hours and you give me five gigantic books with everything from electrical to plumbing to concrete to everything you can imagine has to do with contracting, everything. And you have to find it in those five books. And you got six hours to do so to fill out a 400 question test. And the first time around, he didn't get it in time. Second time around, he said, we'll see this week. But the thing is, oh, that's no problem. Open book, piece of cake. 
Huh. You got pages upon pages to look for. What is the electrical code for this city? What is the contracting code for framing in this city? But he said, you know what? And he said something that hit me. He said, all the answers are in the book. I just have to know where to find them. And I thought to myself, all the answers are in the Bible. We just got to know where to find them. I'm glad he's taking the test and not me because I'd be a nervous wreck and I couldn't be able to think anything to have, especially if you know there's a time going off. That's even worse. But as I thought about search the scriptures, what do we know about the Bible? As a man, as a woman, what do we need to know about the Bible and how do we find it? So with the Lord's help, the next two Sundays I want to cover, because there is weight as you see the word scriptures, is a long word. And there's not going to be enough time today to be able to cover every single letter in the acrostics. Because I want us to understand that this is our guidebook. This is our GPS. And in order to use it, we got to study. My father, every time he gets a new phone, he's 91 years old. He calls me up, how do I work this stupid thing? And that's his words exactly. Why did you buy it? Get a dumb phone, not a smartphone. <laughs> but he's always like, how do you work this thing? This stupid thing's not, I said, dad, it's the input of the user that makes it do stupid things. It's not the phone. So we have a good laugh about this. But it's like, if you put it in, it's going to do what you put it in. It's just a phone. It's just a computer. It does ha allow user errors most of the time. But you look at the Bible and look what John 5.39 says. The Bible says, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. In God's word he says, search the Bible to make sure you don't think you have eternal life. A mansion in glory. But no, because the Bible from Genesis to Revelation testifies the prophets, the people, everything in there testify of him. Don't think, no. Don't think you know where you're going. Know where you're going. This is the thing when we start on a journey, well, I think I'm going to go to this city and you turn around and go to another city. Now, you know where you're going. And I was laughing this week because somebody posted on Facebook at the regiment, how many remember using this? And it was the MapQuest printout sheet. I'm like, he, he, I remember going, even before going, going to AOL, signing on and typing out MapQuest and getting all of our turn by turn directions and putting it in my tractor trailer just before I started out and trying to read it while you're driving. That was pretexting, amen? And having that big old Rand McNally map book and I made sure mine was laminate. You know why? Because I always spilled my coffee in the truck. So I made sure it was going to be wiped off real quick and continue shifting the gears and going on. But you know, it was my guidebook. When I started out any journey, I had to make sure I had my trip destination, my log books, my maps, my directions, because I needed to know I could get there. Before we start our life journey, make sure we have our guidebook. It's got our GPS. It's got our map book. It's got everything we need to keep us straight. And this morning as we begin this journey of looking at the acrostics of Scripture, I pray it's a blessing to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, use this word and this simple analogy of the word Scriptures to challenge our hearts, to help us understand the importance of God's word and how it can help us through all manner of life, through all ages of life, and through all circumstances if we just apply it. Thank you for all you've done for us and all that you're going to do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Scriptures, how should we approach them? When I was younger, I could care less. They were just something I had to read and had to do and had to this. I knew Jesus Christ as my Savior, but as I was growing in my own independence, I became like the prodigal son. I'm going to make my own life. I'm going to have God on the side in case I need him. And I'm going to do my own little thing. I found out after 14 years that didn't go so well. That as a child of God, God does not need to be a secondary driving assistance. He needs to be the driver, not the co-pilot. 
And as we look at life, I realized the older I got and the more troubles I got through and the more circumstances, the more life happened. Life's not easy. We set out with rose-colored glasses after we get married and think, hey, everything's going to be a piece of cake. <laughs> I wish, well, don't you? And then, then life just seems like turns and turns and turns. and turns. But it's how we handle it. Every one of us, there's not one of us that's not gone through some hardship in our life. But it either, as it, my mom was told in prisoner war camp by her teacher, it either makes you bitter or better. How do we take the outcome of life? Do we become bitter at the circumstances or do we become better because of the circumstances? And that's where God's Word is. Scripture shows us how we should approach the Bible to learn from the richness of His pages. It's not just a group of stories. There is so much that we can learn and be challenged to be better for God. The Bible is man's guidebook for all matters. This morning I want to offer some wisdom from an acrostic, and I trust it's a blessing for you. First of all, I want you to show in the S of Scriptures, we are to study it systematically. And in Luke chapter 24, turn with me there please, Luke chapter 24 and verse 27. One of the things that I tried to do before beginning any journey, you realize when you are, have a 53 foot trailer or anything else towing behind you, you better make sure your route is right. I've only made one mistake because I did not, I've made many, but I'm going to use this one as an example, made one mistake by not looking at the map properly. The old Rand McNally map book did have the heights of bridges. <clears throat> but I was going in the backwoods town of Alabama, and I did not, I figured, I know this place, but here's the problem. I'd been there with my company truck. A Silverado is not the same size as a T-800 Kenworth pulling a trailer. And I got to this place, and I knew there was a railroad bridge. But the railroad bridge was 12-5. I needed 13-2. And the problem with this, it was down in a holler. And there was nowhere to back up. So fortunately, as I got down there, I realized, rut row, I made a big mistake. And then I thought, how in the world am I going to back up this hill, going around this hairpin, and get back out to the main road? Fortunately, a deputy was coming this way, and he helped me. And it was a two-hour backup because I had to get back around this hairpin carefully without taking the hydro poles out. And it was a difficult journey, but it was one I learned a lesson. Always make sure you read the entire map and make sure you look at every bridge there is because it took a lot of time out of mine and it gave me a lot of gray hairs because it is not easy backing up a trailer around a corner with one police officer that does not know if you cannot see him in the mirrors, you cannot see him. And he's constantly behind my truck. I'm like, I can't see you. Please stand where you are where I can see you. And as I was remembering that systematically is what we would drill into people. Study the map book properly. And that's what systematically is. You study it with a purpose. And Luke chapter 24, verse 27, it says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The Lord Jesus sat in the temple, beginning at Moses in Genesis, and all the prophets, every scriptures concerning him as the Messiah. The Bible is a guidebook on who Jesus Christ is. Therefore, we must study it systematically if we're going to know God. A lot of people talk about God. A lot of people think they know God. But do we really know? I've been saved for many years, but I still don't know Him like I should. The book is there. You know how many times in three and a half years I looked at that map book? And I still have it. I found it in my closet the other day. That was a great $60 birthday present for me. I studied that a lot, and I'm glad it was laminated because it would have been wore out. But how many times I used an erasable marker to trace in yellow 
across that laminate thing the directions that I was going. And then at the end of the trip, I'd wipe it off, put something back on there, and go on. How many times I printed out MapQuest and other things to systematically study my route to know where I'm going so I don't have to back up all those miles around a hairpin turn. Because I did not want to make a mistake. How much more should we as human beings, people, study God's work to make sure our life is the best journey we can have? How much more should we take time out of life to study systematically the scriptures to know who we'll meet at the end of our life? Wouldn't it be bad to never want to get to know your family other than your immediate family? Who's my uncles? Who's my aunts? Who's my grandparents? Well, they're not, my, uh, they're not a part of my immediate family, so why should I care? No. The journey is getting to know the people around you. The journey is getting to know our Lord. Because at the end, we will ultimately stand before Jesus Christ, our Savior, and give account for the life that we lived. And he's going to ask us many times when we failed, why didn't you use the guidebook? I gave you a guidebook. You know, the first thing my boss said, did you read your map? When he realized I didn't get to the destination on time, he calls me up and he goes, what took you so long? Um, took a wrong route. Did, did you not look at the map? Yes and no. I looked at the map from a Silverado pickup, not from a Kenworth. Two different maps. I did not realize, hey, I can pass under any bridge I want to in the Silverado. It's not going to rub anything. But with the tractor trailer, it's a different story. Life is different turns. Just because we've been down a route before doesn't mean it's going to be the same response the next time. Every one of us lives. Every one of us may go to the same job every day. But next day, God may allow an accident in the way. God may allow something to happen in the way. God may put somebody in your way that he wants you to talk to. Every day is different. It's a new day. So we can't, oh, I, I did that yesterday. God may say, I'm going to change it up on you. I'm going to rearrange your puzzle pieces on you. I'm going to do something to make it different so you rely upon me. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, 14, he says, Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about the words to no profit. It's not about debating how we want to change the God's word to fit us and our lifestyle. It's about, as he says, putting your remembrance of what the Bible says. Systematically, it's important for us to take time to study God and who he is, not who we think he is. You ask people who God is, you get a variety of answers. 18 years as a senior pastor, I've heard a lot of good stories who God is. But you know the question I ask him, do you know God? Well, I talk to him every day. You know what the answer that I've used? You can talk on the phone every day, but if you never call anybody, you can just talk to yourself. I can pick up the phone and don't, answer, don't raise your hand, but how many times when we didn't want to talk to somebody, we pick up the phone real quick, act like we're talking to somebody. Don't, don't raise your hands now. <laughs> We've all done that. Oh, yeah, I don't want to talk to that person. Well, let's act like we're on the phone. We're talking to air. It's like a child talking on the old Fisher-Price phone. They're, they're really going to talk to someone. But they're really not. And that's where I talk to God every day. But is He hearing you? Is He listening? Because the Bible tells us twice in Isaiah and in Psalms that if we regard iniquity in our heart, He will not hear us. If we have sin in our lives, if we are holding sin that we're refusing to repent, don't expect God to answer. The what he, prayer he wants to hear from you is, Father, forgive me for I've sinned. But we think, oh yeah, I'm going to continue to live my life and I'm continue asking God blessings. And the way I look at it is, how well did that work with your father and mother? Not obeying them, not doing what they wanted. You think they're still going to give you benefits and your allowance? Didn't work in my house. Maybe it worked different in yours. But if I disobeyed, I wasn't getting the keys on Friday night. Dad was like, nope, you didn't listen to me. You're not getting the keys. But that's the way I grew up. When I had a good relationship with my father, he blessed me. When I had a poor relationship, I just lived. Second of all, I want you to see in the C, 
carefully. Carefully. One thing I have learned in my life with my whole attitude, but not only attitude, on how I think about things, and I still struggle with this day with my dyslexia and other things I struggle with, I'll look at something and I'll assume I see a word. In my mind, I see that word, but it's not on pages. It's not on here. That's why I do not envy my brother taking tests because I add things when it shouldn't be added or delete things when it should be there. And it's my, my mind is perfect, but on paper, it's completely different. But carefully, don't assume you know what's going to happen in life. Don't assume you know how your race is going to end. Don't assume you know exactly what the Bible says. Because we're still learning. We're still learning. I don't have the answers to life because some of you are older than I am and I can still ask my dad, how do you do? I don't know. I'm still figuring it out. And he's 91. He said, I'm at the end of my journey and I still haven't figured out life. It's a day by day. If we figured life out in the first part of our life, we wouldn't need anybody's help. It's like most men in asking for directions. Honey, I know you're lost. I'm fine. I know exactly where I'm going. Stop and ask directions. No, no, I'm good. And we continue getting more and more lost. <laughs> and the wife's over like, I told you so. But no, we have to carefully, Psalms 1 and verse 2, the Bible says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. To carefully understand what Scripture says, we've got to take time to study. We've got to take time to know where those answers are. Because there will be times when you do not have the Word of God handy. Think about when many of us grew up. I did not have my first computer until university in 1990, and it was an expensive gold brick. And my phone 10 years ago had more memory than it had. You think about that. Many of us didn't grow up with a phone in our pockets. Many of us either had a New Testament in the car, New Testament in the pocket, or something like that. We didn't have a readily access. So we learned when we were in Sunday school we as kids, memorization of Scripture. We learned to hide the Word of God in our heart to help us. But you know, as we've got older, guess what? We've come relying upon electronic devices to help us know where things were. I don't know how many of you remember in Sunday school when we were younger, sword drills. The teacher would holler out Matthew 28, 19, and every kid would have their Bible like that, and you'd have to turn there. We don't do that anymore. We don't think about that. Sword drills. How fast can we get to scriptures? How well do we know our Bible to know? Where is Micah? Where is Habakkuk? Where is First and Second Timothy? Do we know the Word of God? Have we carefully studied to know where to find stuff? When we do in life, we know exactly in our house where this is, where our fire extinguishers are, where this is, where that is. We carefully know. Why? Because when we get up in the middle of the night, we know a flashlight's here, this is over here. We know the layout of our house. Because we've planned it, we've studied it through our actions every day, through our movements, through everything like that. This is life. But when it comes to God's Word, we're kind of lost in it. Because we haven't carefully studied and searched the Scriptures to know, when I'm hurting, where do I go? What's the address I need to go to? When I feel like the burdens are all upon me, where do I go? Cast all your cares upon me, for he careth for you. Matthew 6, When I'm struggling financially, I'm not sure how to make ends meet. What does the Bible say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Where, where do we go? Think about David when he says, in Psalms 13, what a sad, sad Psalms where he cries out and he goes, God, have you forsaken me? And then the last part of it says, I'm so thankful you haven't. Where do we go when we're hurt? Think about Paul. 
He said, when all men have forsaken me, save the Lord Jesus Christ. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. God is there. Even the Lord Jesus wept at his friend's death in Lazarus. He wept. Even he hungered and thirsted. Even he felt alone. Even he was crushed when he sat over Jerusalem and wept and says, I would have saved you all. I would have gathered you under me by wings. I would have taken you and given you everything you needed, but you would not. Where do we go for that comfort? You know, it says a great while before day, the Lord Jesus went to the mountains to be alone with his father. When is our great while before? When do we get up? Is it in the night? Is it in the morning? Is it during the day? It's while we're driving. Where do we pour our hearts out to the Lord? Have we carefully searched the scriptures to know what verses minister to us? I know friends of mine that every morning they put a new scripture on their steering wheel. They put it on their mirrors. They put it on their computer screens. They put it on this to remind them of God's blessings, to remind them of God's bounty, of his grace, of his mercy. One verse that I know he always put it out, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. To show him how important he was to Christ. That while we were despicable, while we were nothing, yet Christ loved us enough to die for us. To remind ourselves, every one of you, when you think you're worthless, remember God says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You, me, we are the apple of his eye. That's in the word of God. To remind you, you are perfect to him. Yes, I may be follicle challenged and lost my hair, but I'm still perfect to him. I may be vertically challenged. I may be horizontally challenged. I don't know, whatever. But I am perfect to him. But sometimes I look around and say, I want to be, no, God made me who I am. God made me with my speech. God made me with my disabilities. God made me who I am. And I should thank him. We live in a world Everybody has to have a nip and a tuck and this and that and everything to look like this perfect person. But we're never going to stop aging, amen? amen? We're not what we look like at 20 years old. Good thing we're married, amen? <laughs> you know, I would have trouble in the dating scene today. But you know, carefully study the scriptures. But the Bible also says reverently. Remember, when we open God's word, in the R of scriptures, it's reverently. We open God's word with such carefulness and reverently. In Psalms 19, verse 7 through 11, Psalms 19, verse 7 through 11, the R in reverently, it says in Psalms 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. In verse 8, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and the righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover by them is thy servant warned, and the keeping of of them there is great reward. The Bible gives us great insight of who God is. Do you notice Psalms 19? The law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord. Everything about God's Word is God's Word. It's from God. Yes, He used human penmen to put his thoughts down. But look what he's done through us. People look around and say, it's a man written book. Yeah, man wrote it. But God authored it. It's no different than what we would call a ghost writer. We've all written, uh, read books throughout our life that are written by somebody that we're like, who is this person? It's a pseudonym. It's a ghost writer. 
Someone writes, I mean, most of our political leaders, they write their books after they get out of power. They didn't write their books. They had somebody write it for them. Very rarely do you actually have a biography anymore that actually somebody's actually writing their own story. It's about that person written by someone else. So this is exactly what the Lord did many years ago. He used great men of God, and it says it was inspired. And he put it all. And what's amazing about God's Word, it's written over 1,500 years, and there's no contradictions in it. Isn't that amazing? If that was man writing it on their own accord, there would be a lot of arguments and a lot of dissension and a lot of contradictions. But that's not God. If he can make you and I in the aspect we are, have you ever looked inside the human body? Man, it's not happenstance. It's miraculously made. And as you look at the Word of God, we ought to be a little bit reverent. When we study God's Word with the attitude, we're wanting to hear from God. When we think about if we had the privilege of having an audience with our queen, how would you walk into her courts? I knew you were going to ask me. I'm the greatest person in all of Canada. Thank you, ma'am. I knew I deserved No, I guarantee you each and every one would be shaking in our boots. We would have our best tux, best dress. We would make sure that we hadn't eaten for a week so we could fit in our tux and dress. And we look good. And we're presenting ourselves to our queen. And we would walk in there and we would all bow. And we would not speak until we were spoken to. We would not shake our hand until we were allowed to. We would not stand and say, selfie. There would be no irreverence, would there be? Absolutely not. There's a great respect for the authority and the office of the queen. There ought to be a great respect and authority for the office of the king of kings and lord of lords. And his book. It's a holy book. It's a book that has been around for centuries. And it's amazing. They're still finding scrolls across the Middle East, and they are pretty much reading almost identical when it's translated in English to what we have in our Bible today. Imagine that. That's what's fascinating. That's when I study history and all the years, when I studied archaeology in Bible college and seminary, back in the 90s, they were talking about stuff matching up. And guess what? They're still talking stuff matching up. Why? Because it's God's living word. As he says to the woman of the well, it's the springs of living water. It's never going to run dry. It's not going to contradict itself. It's just going to confound the wise. How in the world does this man-made book line up with scrolls found that written thousands of years ago? Hmm. Because it was divinely inspired by using normal people like you and I to write God's word. But as we study, we ought to study systematically, carefully, reverently, but intently. Intently. When we study, when I was talking to my brother about him studying, he says, I've got to cut off the phone. I've got to make sure I have no distractions. I've got to make sure that I have quiet so I can intently study to know where the answers are for these things. That is important for us to understand. It is not something we take lightly. Don't assume we know God's Word. Don't assume we're going to go, hey, I know exactly where to find this. My dad, my father-in-law has been preaching for more years than I'm alive. But you think about this. They don't even know where everything is in scriptures because it's alive. It's real. Every day is a new day. I guarantee you, as you read through your Bible, every year you're going to find something new. Every day you're going to find something new that means something for that day. God gives you exactly what you need for that day. And this is why when we study intently, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 2, verse 2. 
when we search the scriptures daily, it's intently. Take time when you look at the acrostics of scripture, the first part is systematically. Really steady to know what's on the pages. Carefully, reverently, but intently. And Proverbs 2 verse 2 says, So that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thy heart to understanding. We have to apply what we read. We all go get our G license. But in order to pass it, it was easier back when most of us got it. But now it's a little bit more difficult. They're making it more difficult to make sure and they're having tears to understand what you're doing before they give you the keys and say, have at her. Why? Because people are less attentive today than they were 20 years ago. They're to a day and age where as a police officer told me a couple weeks ago, people are deserving of things, whether they are or not. They're entitled. I deserve a driver's license. Well, if you've never ridden a test, if you've never driven a car, you don't deserve a driver's license. If you're not going to obey the laws and endanger people around you, you don't deserve a driver's license. Driving is a lot of responsibility. It's not you I'm worried about. It's the other car in front of me that's doing all these stupid things. Today in age, just because there's an inch between me and the other bumper doesn't mean you should take it. Here's the thing. Our people today don't understand the responsibility given. And this is what the Bible says. Incline your ear into wisdom. Learn to listen to the wisdom around you and apply it. Many of you are grandparents. Your prayer and hope is that your grandchildren will be able to sit down and listen to the advice you give them. That's every grandparent's prayer. Why? You have 60, 70, 80, 90 years of knowledge to give to them. As my parents said, when you're 18, you're going to take your own wings and fly. But we're here to help you. What does that mean? They're there to give us advice because we're just beginning. I don't have life and answer. And at first, I was like, yep, I'll call you if I need you. Not. Well, after crashing and burning a few times, learning from the University of Hard Knocks, you realize dad and mom are pretty smart. <laughs> they know a lot of things that I don't know. But that's why I should have listened more attentively. And I think about this a lot. Many of my university professors have passed on from the time I was 18. Some of them were great men of God. And my first year of university was an absolute waste. I'll be honest. I took my tests and I did good in some of my tests. But I studied just to pass. How many of us done that in university? We studied just for the moment not for the future. When I had to go back and begin back in university to finish up some of my few of my degrees back in 2010, I'm now a pastor. I'm now a father, a husband, and I have a lot of other responsibilities and I'm back in university. This time my dime means a whole lot more than when it did in 18 and it was a little bit more intently studying because I wanted to learn what was being taught and I wanted to glean the knowledge of the professors and the time that they put in to teach me. And I say the last two years to finish up my last degrees was more profitable to me than the first few years in the degrees because I was invested into studying. And you know what? Same way the older I get, sadly it should never be the case, the more I'm invested in studying God's Word. The more I'm seeking to know who God is. Intently. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12, the Bible says, for when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become such as have need of milk 
and not of strong meat. For when? For the time you ought to be teachers. That's the way I looked at it. The older God, I should be in the teaching stages, but I just want to be back in the milk stage because I'm not ready for strong meat yet. I'm not ready to be there yet because when I should have, I didn't. Isn't that a case with a lot of us? We should be farther along spiritually than we are. But as one professor said, some of you in the classroom is going to be slow growers. <laughs> we are. We grow at different paces, but we really should grow. And is there any excuse? There was none in my life. You know why? Because I chose 14 years of my life to kind of put God on the back burner on the shelf and go live the life that I wanted to live, climb the corporate ladders, do the things I wanted to live. Didn't work out like I thought because that wasn't God's plan. It wasn't God's plan because in 1988 in Faith Baptist Church of Chilliwack on Hawking Drive, God touched my heart to preach the gospel. And I said, nope. But it wasn't until 2003 God finally got my attention. That's a long time and many miles in between. But God's patient and long-suffering. You can try to outrun God. But if God has chosen you for a purpose, you're not going to get very far. You may think you can get some far distance. And I thought moving to the States away from British Columbia is going to be a long distance, but Jonah tried that too and didn't work. Intently, systematically, carefully, reverently, intently, and finally this morning, prayerfully. Everything we have to do should be bathed in prayer. Pray about it. Seek God's wisdom. If I had prayed more about my decisions in life, I guarantee you I wouldn't have gone through some of the troubles and trials that I went through. I look at life and a lot of the decisions and a lot of the calamities that fell on my family is because I went in headlong without systematically, carefully, reverently, intently asking God. I know the way, I know what I'm doing, and I'm going to do it anyway. You know the old saying, the dumbest saying I've ever heard? It's better to ask forgiveness than permission. How does that work out? Usually when we say that, we already know the answer. We already know what we should do. We're all smart people. But sometimes we think we're going to convince ourselves to do it. And let's be honest, we've all convinced ourselves in our lives to do something we shouldn't do and we regretted it later. Been there, done that, have too many t-shirts in my drawer to prove it. That's the problem in life. We're young and we made some pretty foolish decisions because it was what we lusted after and not what we needed. It was meeting our greeds and not our needs. And the Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse 5, please James chapter 1 and verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and unabradeth not, and it shall be given him. Wisdom. What a great word. We go to school, we go to trade school, we learn from the greats around us, we go to university for wisdom, knowledge, to learn, to pass the trade on, to pass the skill on, to pass whatever on. But how many of us go to university saying, I already know the answers. <laughs> Now, unfortunately, there's always going to be a student. I had two in my freshman class that knew all the answers. So the professors always kindly asked them the answers in front of everybody. And I realized real quickly, if you don't know the answer, don't pretend to know the answers because you may be made a fool of. So I learned to keep my mouth shut in a heartbeat because I didn't want to be put at the front of the class to stand in front of the chalkboard and give the rest of the 70 students your answer. And it was wrong. Because unfortunately... The professor's not there because he doesn't know the answers. He's teaching because he knew the answers. And he had some answer to pass on. The first university that I went to, 
Every one of the professors had a minimum of 30 years of pastoral experience. I think, I think that's a pretty good accolade. They had the experience behind the teaching of counseling. They had the teaching behind the biblical, the theological, the archaeology. They'd been there, done that. And we as 18-year-olds, what do we know? We know everything. We're smart. We've arrived. Prayerfully. And the problem is in our life, when we're younger, we think we can handle life. As my dad would say, son, you're going to leave into the world and you're going to think you're strong enough to take the bull by the horns. You're not. That's the problem. Many of us, like, we're young, we're tough, we can take it on, and now that we're older, we look back with the scars of life and go, I should have prayed more. I should have asked God's wisdom more. I didn't have the answers. I should have realized, if any man lack wisdom, I lack it. I could have saved X amount of time, I should have saved X amount of heartache. I should have, could have saved my family some really tough times if I hadn't been so bullheaded and just bowed my head and said, God, I need help. God, I, I need your assistance. I don't know what tomorrow holds. But as the Bible says, we know who holds tomorrow. As Paul says, I know whom I believe. I don't know what the future will hold for any of us. I don't know if any of us will ever make it back to service tonight. I don't know if God is going to say, it's time for you to come home. I do not know. But I know that whatever the future holds, God's going to be there. And I know that I can still pray to Him, and He's still going to hear me, and He's still going to give me wisdom. He's still going to give me the strength. As Paul says, I've asked Him three times to remove the messenger of Satan from me, the thorn in my flesh. But the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. I know, just like that's exactly what my parents said, God's grace will get us through. It wasn't what we wanted to hear about mom, but God's grace will get us through. We may not like what life holds, but God has already been there. Prayerfully, Psalm 119, verse 18. Open thou my eyes that I may behold the wondrous things out of thy law. What a prayer. God, open my eyes that I may see what you want me to see. And it's the wondrous things. If you can look up the word prayer, you'll see so many references about praying for seeking God's will and having him show you wonderful things out of God's word. Before we open up God's Word and begin studying with a predisposition of what it's going to say, open up with an empty heart and an empty mind and prayerful lips and saying, God, I'm empty and I need you to fill me. I'm empty and I need your guidance for today. Today's a new day. It's a dawning of a new day. I don't know what today holds, but you do. So help me in scriptures today. Give me the verse for me today. Give me the words for me today. Help me to walk as you'd have me walk. Give me the strength I need for today. You know, isn't it interesting when the disciple says, Lord, teach me to pray. His model prayer is a phenomenal prayer because it kind of gives you a basic structure. It's about the first time I was ever sat in a homiletics class, they gave you a structure how to make a sermon. You know what the professor says? This is a structure not for you to take and preach a sermon of. This is to teach you what to look for and what to do. And this is where the Word, the word of God records the model prayer. It is the Lord's Prayer, but if you really want to see the Lord's Prayer, you turn to John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17. Especially 17. That really gives the Lord's heart and prayer. But this is a model prayer. He's asking for God to meet his needs. He's giving praise to the Father in heaven. He's also asking God to keep his path straight. Keep me from temptation. And on and on. Have a forgiving heart. Have this. How do we start our day? Why don't we just take that model prayer and take verses through it 
Say, Lord, help me here. Help me here. Help me here. Because it's a good structure for us to build our prayer life off. Of. Not repetitions of this little prayer, but build the structure off. Praise God. Look at the Psalms. How many times did Dave just... The whole time, whole psalms just praising the Lord. You're a wondrous God. You're a glorious God. You're this. Who doesn't like praise? You can be in a crowded room and hear her name and say, boy, he's a, he's a good person. She's a great person. You're like, and? Keep on? Everybody likes praise. How much more does our Heavenly Father? Praise Him because He's worthy. Ask Him to help you to keep you from temptation. Ask Him for your daily bread. Not your weekly, not your monthly. Ask God to provide for today what you need today. Prayerfully. If any man, any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and unabradeth not, and it shall be given him. God is not stingy. My dad used analogy when I was a kid. We didn't get a lot of snow in Chilliwack very rarely did we do, if any. We got a lot of liquid sunshine. Rained a lot. But one thing I do remember, the times we did, our city didn't quite know how to handle snow. And they end up making more of a mess than they did everything else. So the constituents, the citizens, were not happy on how the plows worked. They're not as proficient as Ontario. So it made a bigger mess than it was. And I remember my dad and I and my brother... We were cleaning out the entire parking lot of our church. And we just got it all cleaned out. And the city pulled into our parking lot and left the pile of snow. They saw an open parking spot, didn't pay attention to the Faith Baptist Church, but they literally just turned their plows right back in our parking space. And my dad leans against the shovel and starts laughing. And I'm like, that's not funny. <laughs> That is not funny. He just dumped his, instead of just going down the road straight, he just pulls in and dumps, pulls back out and goes on. And we're sitting with this mound of snow going, church time is just, you know, what are we doing? And you know what my dad does? He leans over and he says, son, that's like God's blessing. We think we're doing something good for God, giving him a snow shovel of our works. And he just comes and piles a snow plow on us. And I thought, what a good, here I am mad because we got to do more shoveling. And here my dad is preaching a sermon. He goes, this is like us, you know, we're just doing our little works and here comes God. <laughs> Have some blessings. And you know what? That's exactly what Isaiah says. You have blessed us more than we deserve. Isn't that the case? We are blessed here. We're blessed in our country. yes. We've got a lot of bad things going on, but we've got a lot of good things too. We've got good people still in our country. We've got good community still. We've got a shelter. We've got a church. We've got vehicles. We've got jobs. We've got each other. We've got a family. We're blessed. Because we could have been born in countries that are impoverished. We could not have been born at all. And never experience the life that God's given us. We're blessed. We can either look at. My wife did not fill my cup all the way up. Or I can say. I got a glass of water. One of the two. How do we look at. Just like my mother. Mrs. Goforth told her all the time. Three and a half years in that Japanese concentration camp. You can be bitter. Or you can be better. How do we want to look at life. But when we look at scriptures, remember, look at it systematically, carefully, reverently, intently, prayerfully. Don't ever open up God's word without bowing your head and saying, God, show me your wondrous works. Show me you today and what you want me to do. And watch God answer because he says, it shall be given him. You have not because you ask not. May we remember that today when we look at scriptures. Lord willing, I'll finish up the rest of them next week. But I trust you'll remember these systematically, carefully, reverently, intently, and prayerfully.
Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, your word is rich. Your word is divine. Lord, it has helped me through life, and it has hurt me when I've not bothered to open up the pages to seek wisdom and guidance. Lord, it has been applicable to every turn, every twist in life. Thank you for your word and how it's there for each and every one of us and how it will mean something completely different as it is individually appointed to each one of us. Thank you. As the Bible says, you are our Father, we are your children. Each one of us is going to have a different relationship with you. Each one of us is going to be spoken differently to by you. Lord, help us to listen when you speak. Obey when you speak. And live the life that you have already ordained for us. Lord, help us to study thy scriptures more. Looking to know you more. As your precious letter to us. Written thousands of years ago. And still applicable to us today. Lord, I ask you to dismiss us with your blessing. Be with those that are not feeling well, Lord. We ask you that you just put a special touch upon them. The ones that are suffering from cancer. Lord, would you just continue to touch them. Continue to heal them. And grace to go through the trial that you've allowed them to embark upon. Bring us back this evening at 5 o'clock as we open up thy word. And we look at having the right attitude of life in everything that we do. In Jesus' precious and wonderful name, amen. I want to thank each and every one of you for attending community this morning. May the Lord bless you. May you have a great afternoon. Look forward to seeing each and every one of you at 5 o'clock tonight. Lord bless.